please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Hello and welcome. You're watching CNBC TV 18 and this is After the Bell. First, uh, get straight to the top global story of the day. Facebook founder and CEO Mark Zuckerberg has broken his five-day silence on the data breach scandal involving voter profiling firm Cambridge Analytica. In a note shared on Facebook last evening, Zuckerberg said, and I'm quoting now, we have a responsibility to protect your data and if we can't, then we don't deserve to serve you, end quote. Further sharing the details of the genesis of this crisis and Facebook's plan to prevent such data harvesting and manipulation in the future, Future, the Facebook founder said, and I quote again, while this specific issue involving Cambridge Analytica should no longer happen with new apps today, that doesn't change what happened in the past. We will learn from this experience to secure our platform further and make our community safer for everyone going forward, end of quote. Now, later in an interaction with CNN, Mark Zuckerberg reiterated his apology and specified some steps that the social media giant is undertaking to prevent a similar data theft in the future. Well, that's the Facebook CEO and how the company plans to address the concerns of its users are much needed clarity on what lies ahead. But in India, the political war over the Facebook data scandal has further intensified. Law and IT Minister Ravi Shankar Prasad has levelled fresh charges against the Congress, accusing the party of using Cambridge Analytica's services during the Gujarat elections. I Congress party se sawal pooch raha hun, ki Cambridge Analytica ko ke roop mein karne ke liye socha tha. हमारा स्पष्ट आरोप है कि कांग्रेस पार्टी ने उनकी सेवाएं ली हैं गुजरात में भी ली हैं जिस तरह का राहुल गांधी ने भाषण किया गब्बर सिंह टैक्स और क्या-क्या क्या कांग्रेस क्या? पार्टी को ऐसी कंपनी मिली थी जिनके ऊपर डाटा चोरी का आरोप है यह गंभीर सवाल है that's one side, but of course the opposition is not going to be silent. So after staying silent for a day, Congress President Rahul Gandhi has finally responded to BJP's accusations that the Congress has been using services of Cambridge Analytica. The firms are accused of data theft and manipulation. Rahul Gandhi took to Twitter and called the charges an invention by the BJP. He accused the BJP of using this controversy as a diversionary tactic to deflect attention from the death of the 39 Indians in Iraq. And talking about uh, data breach concerns, a five-judge constitutional bench of the Supreme Court continues to hear the arguments in the Aadhaar case. It's the turn of the government now to present its arguments in the Apex Court and the court has allowed the government to do so with the help of a PowerPoint presentation. So the Unique Identification Authority CEO Ajay Bhushan Pandey is making a presentation in the Supreme Court to ask he transpired in their presentation. But staying with Aadhaar, government's case for Aadhaar remains strong even after the Facebook data breach. That's the word coming in from former chairman of UIDAI, Nandan Nilakani. Talking to the media today, Nilakani expressed confidence that the government will win the Aadhaar legal battle. He also spoke about his role in the government's ambitious national health care program and said that he was just a plumber for that scheme. Here's his rationale on that. I think the government has a very strong case. In fact, as you know, the uh, case is currently on in the Supreme Court and uh, the government started its uh, you know, arguments yesterday. So I'm, I'm very confident uh, that uh, the government will win the case. But they use a very weird brick and mortar argument, 13 foot high walls and 5 foot... No, I think physical infrastructure is part of security. I mean, you, you want to make sure that nobody else gets in, right? You also have to have digital infrastructure, but you need both physical and digital security. Building a system for the population, you have to think scale, right? Now, this is a massive project where they want to give 100 million families, which means about 500 million people insurance. So that's, I'm really, I'm a plumber, really. I'm a plumber. So plumber who looks at, okay, what does it mean to build such a large system? I'm only coming from that point. So do you think the government has the math right? Because we're talking 10 crore families. I don't know about, I don't know about money and all that. I'm telling you, I'm a plumber. That's our reporter, Jules Sanil, grilling Nandan Nilakani on that statement made yesterday by the Attorney General. But let's shift focus and talk about the day's trading action. After a strong start, markets failed to capitalize and witnessed sustained selling pressure at every bounce to end at a low point of the day. So the Nifty finally broke that 10,200 mark intraday, but corrected from that very level and barely managed to hold on to the 10,100 mark. Sensex saw cuts of about half a percent and kept its head above the 33,000 mark, but banks saw wild swings on weekly expiry day. And that that index ended with losses of about half a percent. Mid caps again underperformed today with cuts of about one percent. Let's bring in Anuj Singhal to put this all into perspective. Uh, Anuj, bears very clearly dominating the day. Does that seem to be a trend as every day passes? Well, uh, bad day for the bulls today. The market is firmly in a sell-on rally market. 
uh, or sell or rally mode. And today again, the market had two rallies. A for starters, that was sold into, and B at 1:30 there was a counter trend move, and that was heavily sold into, and the markets ended at low point. It's, and it's not even the indices that's a problem. Uh, that of course is a problem, but the bigger problem is in the mid caps, where the advanced decline once again was one is to four. Corporate facing banks, uh, SBI, ICICI, access were down. Maruti has been a big down point for the market. HPCL, BPCL were also down. In fact, it was uh, a Reliance and Tata Motors which sort of uh, helped the bulls today, uh, along with some help from ONGC. Otherwise, in the broader market, also some big losers today. HCC, despite all the clarifications, was down 17%. Balram Puccini, JP Associates, the entire ADAG pack led by Reliance Infra, Jet Airways, Ashok Leyland, even the stronger stocks, Mahindra and Mahindra Financial were all down. There were some gainers like Nalco on the Illumina prices, Jubilant Foodworks and IDFC, but you know, few and far in between. Uh, what next for this market? Well, uh, the tape is saying that the market clearly wants to go lower. There's a support nearby, 10,000. That should be a bit of a support and there should be some buying there. But right now, 200 day moving average is now acting as a bit of a resistance. And let's see if this market actually has more legs to go on the downside. Okay, we'll have to wait and watch. Anush, thanks for joining in with that. But talking about uh, equity markets, let's talk about the IPO corner then. The broking arm of ICICI Bank, ICICI Securities IPO, opens today and ends on March 26th. The company plans to raise about 4,000 crore rupees with a price band of about 519 to 520 rupees per share with a face value of about 5 rupees each. The company has raised about 1,700 crore rupees through 28 anchor investors, uh, which includes names like Aditya Birla, Axis, Reliance, HDFC, BlackRock, uh, Sundaram, Nomura, UTI, etc. CNBC TV team's Yashen spoke to Shilpa Kumar, the MD of ICICI Securities, and here's what she had to say about the company company's financial performance and the road forward. Over the last five years, our ROE has actually been, uh, you know, 30% plus right. uh, this year um, and uh, last financial year on, on the numbers reported. It is close to 70% ROE. Uh, and also, if you look at our dividend profile, in the last five years, uh, we've paid out 40 to 60% of our earnings uh, we have paid out as dividend, uh, not even including tax. So that explains our capital footprint. Right. Uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, as and when, if capital is required, uh, you know, the bank would think of it. As the other big story today, Modi government's draft defense procurement policy 2018 is finally out. And according to the draft, the government plans to increase foreign direct investment in defense technologies to 75% from the current 49%. The government, in fact, has also very ambitious targets in defense manufacturing, defense exports, as well as job creation, for that matter. Ritu Bhuyan, who's been following up on the policy, joins in now with the details. Ritu, take us to the fine print of the draft policy. It's been long time pending. What stands out? Well, uh, the difference between this uh, draft policy and previous defense procurement policies is that this draft policy has specific targets. For example, it talks about achieving rupees 1.7 lakh crore worth of uh, uh, turnover in defense goods, uh, investments, uh, additional investments of, uh, of uh, 7 lakh crore, 2 to 3 million jobs, uh, as well as defense exports of 35,000 crore. And this all within the next period, uh, next seven-year period ending 2025. So how are they going to achieve that? For that, uh, this uh, policy talks about allowing 75% automatic FDI uh, in defense uh, for niche technology, be 6,000 crore uh, for setting up two defense uh, corridors, uh, auto component uh, manufacturers to be encouraged to, uh, uh, to get into aerospace component manufacturing, uh, having India's own 8 200-seater civilian aircraft, uh, as well as rationalizing import duties uh, on inputs used for defense-related uh, equipment. Last but not the least, uh, there are several uh, specific policy interventions being proposed on startups. Now, it remains to be seen how much of that uh, uh, this uh, uh, government is able to achieve within this uh, year of, 2008, of, of uh, 2018 itself. With that, it's back to you. It's a, it's a tall ask for sure, Ritu. Thanks for joining in with that. Uh, but uh, sticking to news from the national capital, Delhi's Ammadmi Party government has presented a 53,000 crore rupee budget for the national capital. And once again, it has increased allocation to healthcare and education. So it is also focused on steps to tackle pollution in the national capital. Let's uh, understand uh, what really stands out over here. CNN News 18's Rupa Shri Nanda is here with the details. Rupa Shri, take us to the highlights of the Delhi budget? Well, uh, like you mentioned, uh, health and education, of course, uh, they remain priority for the government and the government uh, maintains that this priority is going to stay. 
the uh, point that uh, Manish Sodia, the finance minister, highlighted in his budget is that uh, we aim for a trickle up budget and not a trickle down budget. That means uh, he meant that uh, investment at uh, or with people at the lower ranks of society will yield uh, better uh, re- uh, de- development uh, rewards in terms of uh, finances and also GDP. The other important highlight, of course, is that uh, the Delhi government has uh, said that this is a green budget. And for the first time, it is emphasizing on uh, improving environment. And they have given a 26 a- uh, action plan point uh, 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 plan uh, in order to improve environment uh, uh, conditions in Delhi. And in a way, it has actually shifted uh, from uh, from big projects to small projects. If I can say that it has actually made the small things very big in this budget, for instance, uh, sewage treatment plants, uh, greening and uh, and uh, and uh, landscaping of roads, about 500 roads that are not in central Delhi, but uh, probably 100 meters or 200 meters down the ring road, uh, sewage treatment plants and uh, laying water uh, uh, lines uh, in uh, unauthorized colonies. Uh, so those remain priority areas uh, for the government, and uh, emphasis is also on roads. Uh, um, and improving uh, the infrastructure on roads. And uh, the chief minister, while speaking, also said that this time uh, when the maintenance of roads will be done, uh, the monitoring of that will be done by people and not uh, just uh, government officers because it uh, because it seems that every time a road is maintained and money is spent, uh, just a few days after that you find the road in a, in a similar condition again. Uh, so emphasis is also greening Delhi, making Delhi more beautiful and uh, going from big projects to small projects. Okay, Rupa, thank you so much for joining in. Welcome back. Now, this is the Supreme Court today ordered that status quo be maintained on the debt laden in Reliance Communications sale of assets to Reliance Geo. Now, the petition was filed by a consortium of banks. The Apex Court refused to lift the stay order from the Bombay High Court on the asset sale. The State Bank of India had yesterday moved the Apex Court challenging a tribunal's order, which was upheld by the Bombay High Court. Now, this essentially allows Ericsson to stake, stake a claim on Arcom's consolidated assets. Remember, Reliance Communications has unpaid dues of 1,150 crore rupees to Ericsson. The top court will hear the pleas from the consortium of banks and Arcom on the 5th of April. Reliance Communications has issued a response. It says, and I quote, as legally advised, Arcom remains confident that its asset monetization program will be completed expeditiously to protect the interest of its secured lenders. Much in advance of the time limit of 31st August 2018 prescribed by the RBI for resolution of such cases. Uh, and here's an exclusive interview. Existing promoters are trying to derail the IBC process. Strong comments coming in from Harsh Goenka, chairman of RPG Enterprises, speaking to CNBC TV 80's Prashant Nair about the delays in resolution of NCLD cases. Goenka says that the business community is at fault and the promoters are the ones who are derailing the resolution process. The erstwhile promoters, I think they are extremely scared because uh, they, what is left behind is a fair amount of muck. And if any, any audit happens, which may happen once a new promoter takes over. There will be an entire trail that they would have left behind. And therefore, I can see existing promoters trying to delay uh, tactics or get out of the NCLT system so that... Uh, but do you think outside are... interventions should be allowed? I mean, uh, in what we've seen with the as cement asset, for example. Do you think that kind of thing should be allowed or the government... Because it's in the court now, I mean, uh, as you say. Yeah, but, but there is a track which has been laid and why are people challenging the track? You know, if you had to bid for something, you bid at that point of time. You cannot, you cannot go across the system and try to derail the system. And from one exclusive to another, after EESL, Tata Motors backs the electric bus tender under the faster adoption and manufacturing of electric vehicles or FAME. We learn from sources that Tata Motors will supply 190 electric buses to six cities across the country. Ronaja Banerjee is here with exclusive details. Ron, what was the bid that made uh, Tata Motors stand out over here? Well, yes, after winning the EESL tender, Tata Motors has once again won an important electric uh, vehicle tender, this time not for cars, but their electric buses. Uh, what we now understand is that uh, 190 electric buses 
Tata Motors will be supplying out of the 310 uh, that were meant under a specific scheme. Let me just take you through what the, what the background to this is. In December last year, the government, the Ministry of Heavy Industry had launched a multimodal electric public transport scheme that was under the existing FAME policy, whereby which 11 cities were uh, identified wherein uh, these cities would be buying electric buses. The cost uh, would be sort of shared between the central government as well as the state government for which the overall central government was going to spend around 437 crore rupees. This this is pretty much on the lines of JN and URM but of course much smaller in uh, scale and scope. Uh, uh, out of these 11 cities we are told in six of these cities Tata Motors has won the bids. They were of course competing with Ashok Leyland and Mahindra and Mahindra along with uh, one uh, a Chinese um, manufacturer. What we understand is that Tata Motors' bid price has come in under 80 lakh rupees. So again, once again, uh, 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 quoting a price much below what competition had offered. When we contacted Tata Motors, they confirmed uh, that they have indeed won. They've said that 62% of this of the, of the total share of the business uh, has been won by Tata Motors. Tata Motors telling me that they've been continuously investing in the back end and they've be, they have a clear electric vehicle uh, roadmap and strategy going forward. Uh, they are also uh, telling me that, uh, you know, sort of countering the claims of certain manufacturers that Tata Motors will not be making money, they say that there is a clear line of sight as far as profitability is concerned. Okay, Ron, thanks for that. Now let's get to a CNBC TV 18 a special investigation. Mumbai based builder HD Oil finds itself in a bottom of a spot. Its subsidiary, Guru Ashish Constructions, has been accused of defrauding state housing body MADA and hundreds of people in line to own low income houses. CNBC TV 18's Kevin Lee visited the construction site in Mumbai suburbs of Koregaon to understand what exactly happened. This 40 acres of land in Mumbai's Goregao suburb was called Patrawala Chol. In 2006, it was demolished by Guru Ashish Constructions, a subsidiary of HDIL, with state-run housing body Mada's Blessings. The plan then was to build low-income housing units that would house the 670-odd residents of the Chol. Guru Ashish could then sell any homes left over for profit. But 12 years later, there's not a single finished house. This building that you're seeing now, this is where Guru Ashish Constructions was supposed to rehabilitate all the 600 odd dwellers of the Patra Nagar Chol. However, I've spoken to people here and they've said that no additional construction work has happened on this building in the last four years. So, there's now a court case. Abhi, as on today, jo mera writ petition I have filed kiya hai, ki, uh, mera ko rent builder ne nahi diya hai. Jo bhi hamara compensations hai, Mahada officially terminated its contract with Guru Ashish Constructions in January 2018. But that does not solve any of the problems. In an FIR, Mahada has alleged that seven different land parcels in the area were illegally sold by Guru Ashish Constructions to different builders like Ekta Life Spaces and Kalpatru. Mada pegs the total value of these land parcels at 1,034 crore rupees. But the builders who bought this land have almost finished building their own projects on this land and moved court to protect their projects from the fallout of the tussle between Guru Ashish and Mada. We went to the court, to the High Court, and appraised the High Court of the true facts. The High Court was pleased to grant the stay against Mada from taking any kind of coercive action against us. But Mada's options are limited because Guru Ashish Constructions itself has been embroiled in insolvency proceedings since last year. The resolution plan which is being prepared by the RP covers the entire aspect of Mada component, rehab component and every other due which is there from the company will be covered in the resolution plan which will be submitted to the NCLT in the next 10 to 15 days time. 